what's up, everyone? It is Flip Man Dan, and we are back here on the podcast with Rinzi, uh, Ryan and Lindsay, and they are unbelievable sneaker flippers. They have an amazing operation as well as uh, an unbelievable community that they have built around their operation. It's great to have you guys on today. Thanks for having yeah, us on, man. We appreciate you. it. Yeah, so I guess let's start from the top. Uh, you know, just tell us a little bit about the beginning of the journey and how you guys got started. Yeah, we got fired from uh, our previous jobs. He's being nice. I got fired <laughs> from my job. Um, and I came home after just basically I showed up in the morning, all my stuff at work was packed up and um, I was fired. It, it uh, was a little bit messy and I got home really upset and was like, uh oh, like I don't have a job. I have no income. Ryan was bartending at the time. And we knew we could go and get jobs at any place. You know, we both have college um, educations and are both like very personable people. Um, so we knew we could go, you know, to a coffee shop or wherever and get a job. But neither one of us wanted to go and clock in anywhere. We didn't want to work for anyone else. So we started reselling. I think just like everyone else uh, watching this or listening to this, we, we kept hearing about people being their own boss and having financial freedom and making their own schedules. And they're coming from a, di a bunch of different uh, backgrounds. And we, we had seen through social media resellers that were buying stuff and reselling them uh, in other marketplaces. And so we, you know, we would pop into thrifts every once in a while, but we never really did anything, any, anything serious. And we said, Hey, uh, you know, you got fired. I don't, I'm not really fully enjoying my bartending job, although, you know, it was putting money in my pocket. Why don't we try this thing? And that was in June of 2017. And so we basically, uh, I left my bartending job because we wanted to give this a hundred percent of our time. And before we f sold our first pair of shoes, we were full-time resellers that, that didn't know how to resell. And so we, uh, we figured it out as we grew and we ended up paying all of our bills in June of 2017, uh, starting with the shoes in our closet and then growing into sourcing at thrifts. Uh, we paid all of our bills. Uh, the only marketplace we sold on was Facebook marketplace. Um, so looking back, our business model was to buy shoes under $10, hand clean them and sell them for $25. Uh, no matter what they were, uh, we just went with that. And the first, I would say the first, 1200 pairs yeah. that we sold was that exact model uh and then we gr we gradually grew into uh bigger sourcing routes using other marketplaces uh and up until october of 2020 we built our entire full-time reselling business out of our apartment we were moving from apartment to apartment but we always built our business out of our apartment uh and then the space you're seeing behind us right now we call it the sneaker loft uh we moved into in October of 2020, I think that's four months ago. And uh, now uh, we're about three, almost three and a half years into it. And we're uh, doing six figures a year, only selling uh, new and used shoes. That is an unbelievable accomplishment, guys. I just want to applaud you for, you know, taking that huge leap and, and making a living for yourselves. And I, I know that's definitely scary to go full time, but uh, you know, it seemed like, uh, when your backs are up against the wall, you, you had to make some, some brash choices. So, uh, you said that you started with the shoes in your, the shoes in your closet and, uh, who had the bigger shoe collection. And that's, that's pretty amazing that you guys just knew out the gate that shoes was the, the right path for you guys. I probably had a bigger yeah. shoe closet with less that I was willing. <laughs> yeah yeah so i had more shoes that i was willing to sell she had more shoes in quantity but uh, but really we started with everything in our house anything that we weren't using like the keurig that we got a while you know a while before and never used or um random uh candle holders or whatever it might be around our house that we didn't use we were putting up for sale so we started literally just what do we have in our house that'll make us money um, in order to pay that first month of bills because we got, we needed the money then. And then um, through that process, one of the items in the house that we had that we didn't want was a pair of sneakers that Ryan had. Yeah, and uh, two, two things. So it also came from, we didn't have any money to go buy stuff yeah. to flip. You know, a lot of people present day will reach out to us and say, hey, I've got $500. 
I'm going to go buy stuff to resell. And we're like, you should not spend a single dollar. Do what we did. Look in your house, find something that uh, you really don't need anymore. Any, everyone has something that, that is valuable in their house that they can sell for a little bit of money that can then start snowballing. And then more importantly, we respected every single dollar that we then had. So we were very conscious about what we were doing rather than just uh, in that example, just spending $500 and let's see what happens. It was like, okay, we really need to turn a $1 into $2. How do we do that? We really need to take this $10 bill and turn it into $20. How do we do that? And, and we, we gradually grew out of necessity because we had to start with the stuff that we owned because we didn't have any money to, to have a quote unquote buying budget. And then two, we really wanted to build a very uh, consistently profitable business starting from absolutely nothing and, and go from there. And anyone who's listening to this, we really, to this day, now our buying budget is, is obviously more than that. We spend a lot more money per week now on inventory than we did in the beginning, but we literally had no money. We had zero dollars and started with one pair of uh, men's Under Armour running shoes that I had and, and we were off and running. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew out the gate one month in that, you know, th this could work and this is the right path for us. Is that kind of how it went or was there some like l super low time where you were like, I'm not sure if this is going to even be plausible. Uh, tell me about the, the beginning hurdles of that journey. Well, I think as anyone uh, who maybe hasn't come across our stuff uh, or any, anybody around us in the beginning, there was lots of laughter. There was like, are you guys, are you kidding me? You're going to, you're going to make a living, you know, selling shoes and, and you take it a step further, selling used shoes, you're going to make a living buying someone else's used shoes, cleaning them and selling them. And, and so, uh, you know, immediate family members, uh, anyone that, you know, was messaging us online was literally laughing and uh, understandably, it didn't seem like it was possible. We were, I, at least me, I was very naive in the beginning. I had no idea that there was even a market for used shoes. I understood that people collected like Jordans and and did, uh, you know, you had sneaker heads and all things of that nature. But the, the story of our very first sale is, is kind of this big uh, light bulb, this aha moment for myself. Uh, and then I shared, so I had a pair of men's 10 and a half Under Armour running shoes. And we had no idea about value on the marketplace. We had no idea. So we talked it out and we said, hey, why don't we put these up for $25? They don't smell. There's no rips or tears. They still have good tread. We feel good about the product that we're selling. Why don't we put it up for $25? And we, we took photos on, on our uh, coffee table in our living room with like the sunlight coming in through the window. And uh, we posted it and we just said, you know, we described them. We described the color. You know, again, we had no idea about how to put up a quality listing. We were just like, what would a buyer want if they're trying to buy this thing? And so we put up and this gentleman reached out and said, hey, I'm interested in these shoes, $25 can you meet me at the local grocery store? And I was like, holy smokes, like, this is a real thing. Like, like let's do this. So we go down to the grocery store, it's a public place. We, we both drive down there and this gentleman approaches the car and I get out of the car and this is a giant man. This is a huge individual. And so in my head, I started thinking to myself, I was like, I must have messed up. I messed up somewhere. And I, as he's walking towards me, I look down at his feet because I'm selling him a men's 10 and a half shoe my size and this man clearly is is like a men's 15 like he has a big foot and so he comes over and i go uh, you're here for the shoes he's like yeah and so he takes the shoes from me hands me the 25 dollars, and i pause for a sec i'm waiting for him to say like these are too small these are whatever and he's like thank you and i go wait 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 like can you are you gonna try them on like i feel like these are a men's 10 and a half he's like oh yeah that's fine and I, I start, I insisted. I felt like, again, I had done something wrong. So I insisted, I go, can you just try these on? I want to make sure they fit you. I want to make sure you don't go home. And, and just to appease me, I mean, I already have the man's money. He starts to try to jam his size 15 foot into these little shoes and the knuckles of his toes are pushing through the fabric. And he's like, yeah, these are great. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, you're, you're not even, your, your foot's not even in them. He's like, oh, don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell these for 50. And I was like, okay. Like I, I was asking $25. He gave me $25. I go back to the car and I go, Lindsay, th there's something in this. Like we got to figure this out. Like there's someone willing to buy a used pair from me because they're going to go 
sell it for even more, which is cool. So we started really doing a little bit more of, what, I guess, what we call market research and understanding different brands and understanding condition and really said, I think one, there's, there's a lot of people need shoes. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this super niche category where we're only going to have a small amount of people that are interested. There's everyone that needs shoes. And even that there's people who want to buy shoes that aren't even their size because they're going to then resell them. And so that, that light bulb moment really, plus we enjoyed yeah. interacting with shoes. We enjoyed looking up and talking about shoes. I personally did not enjoy learning about coffee makers and trying to figure out the coffee maker and all that. And so you can make a full-time income reselling coffee makers. You can make a full-time income reselling shoes. And we narrowed on what we enjoyed. And just from then on that first month, we paid all our bills and we said, we set our goal too low. And we set our goal the next month for all of our bills plus an additional thousand dollars. And then we hit that. And then we said, geez, we're setting our goal too low. And we've, you know, fast forward three and a half years. And now, uh, just, just, uh, yesterday we bought a car cash in shoe money. Like there's no, there's no financing. There was like, Hey, we need an extra car. Let's do some research. Went boom, paid in cash. So Lindsay, uh, I, I know it's a kind of taboo almost to begin a, uh, a business with your significant other. How did that work out in the beginning and how have you grown, you know, both as life partners and business partners? Our second time we met, which was a date, Ryan asked me to pick him up in my car to go pick up free, free weights on the side of the road at some person's house, like 45 minutes away. In the middle of winter. In the middle of winter. <laughs> and I was like, sure. And so, and so I picked him up and we drove and we were like kicking the weights out of this like ice snow bank and loading them all into my car. Um, so I, he knew from the beginning that I was like game for that sort of thing. And really, I mean, I think we had only been together for maybe six months before we started full um reselling full time so it's been a part of our relationship for almost the entirety and um i'm not i'm not i don't think that this would work for a lot of people we spend 99.9 percent .9 of our time together um but it works for us and we're we're opposites in a really really compatible way where i'm way more like analytical numbers uh more realistic you know grounded and, <laughs> and he's a little bit more big picture um so i don't know we just mesh really well and uh we make sure to divide tasks up in a way where we're utilizing our strengths and it's not it's not my strength to go source i'm not really big on that but for him it is so he does most of that and um we it makes it makes the business run smoother which makes our relationship run much smoother um, we're hopefully adding kids next year. So we'll, or this year, I guess. So we'll see, um, how that changes things as well. That'll be a test for sure for both the business. We're going to build a whole team of few cleaners. <laughs> start, start them in the goodwill immediately. <laughs> yes. But I, think, I think just not forcing it. Like we yeah. both were really interested in it. We both, I mean, you had asked the question if there were ever, like, how long did it take us to realize that we really wanted to do this? I mean, for me, it was day one, like being able to wake up that first day and drink an extra cup of coffee and start the day at nine instead of eight or that weekend we wanted to, you know, go away to Vermont for the weekend or whatever it was and to not have to ask anyone permission to do anything was so like, it's all I needed in my life was like to be able to wake up every day and do whatever I wanted and not need to check in with someone or, um, so day one, I was, I was in for the adventure and then obviously being able to realistically break down the numbers and see that we could pay our, like at the end of June, we were like, Oh, here's our money for all of our bills. We were like, Oh, okay. Like we yeah, like it is, and we can do it. Normal. And it's real. Like this is real money. If you end the month and can't pay your bills, you got a problem. I think uh, another thing that I wanted to add, which I think, again, both business wise and relationship wise is we are we are both very honest with ourselves when no one else is around, when there's no camera, when there's no social media, we're very honest. And so in that first month, every single time, I, I think I said earlier, every time, every single time we were like getting more inventory and like cleaning it and like, listen, like we were very honest with like, if we don't do this, the bills don't get paid. There's no like, 
hey, let's just take a photo for Instagram and like just go sit on the couch and not do anything that's going to make us money. It was very like, like Lindsay said, it's motivating when you have that feeling of not having to ask permission to do the things you want to do. It creates this motivation, which then leads into, you know, a mentality that that our, what we say all the time, there's like no excuses, like you can do the things, which obviously we didn't make that up. But for real, like everyone around us was laughing at us saying there's no way that you are going to be able to pay all of your bills by sourcing shoes, hand cleaning them and reselling them on Facebook. And that first month we did it, the second month we did it, the third month we did it. By month six, we were making more money than all the people around us in their corporate jobs and their whatever. Now, fast forward to where, where we are today and everyone's trying to work with us. They're saying, how can I work with you? I don't want to do this job. I see what you guys have done. And we, we love that. We love, we don't care about people laughing. We don't care about all that. It's to this day, from that day one, as Lindsay said, to this day, we woke up this morning and we said, man, yesterday was so great. We bought a car. We needed an extra car. We're excited about this year. Obviously, we just went into 2021. Like, what do we want to do today? And we said, hey, let's go for a drive with the dog. Let's head into the warehouse, get a couple things done. We're super excited at, at 2 p.m. to do this podcast with you. And then afterwards, we're going to check out for the day. Like, it's going to probably be before 4 o'clock and we're done for the day. And, and that freedom really, really is motivating. And, and then you attach that to a good business model and there's nothing that can stop you. Man, that's awesome. As entrepreneurs, you kind of gain freedom in exchange for, you know, pushing the boat of security out to sea. And uh, it's all on you, really. So uh, I really wanted to dive into a little bit your a little bit about your growth. And right now you're in an amazing warehouse type area where you've got your inventory. I've seen the behind the scenes of how you take photos of your shoes, all that. How did you come to the conclusion that okay, this is going to be my setup, or you know, how did you come to the conclusion that? okay, now it's time to, to get this extra space for inventory. Well, I can answer it in two ways. Uh, in the beginning, up until October of, of 2020, we were like, how can we make the most out of the space that we have? We, we, of course, as we were growing over the last couple of years, we see people with warehouses, we see people with uh, storage units, we see people with all these things. And then we would say, oh, do we need to do that? Should we do that? And then we'd step back and say, can we hit our financial goals in the space that we currently have? And so we got real creative. Uh, in the beginning, it was a, a, a crazy mess, right? We were working out of uh, an apartment where we were living with Lindsay's brother. So there's three of us and he wasn't a reseller. He's a lawyer. So we, we felt so lucky that he was, he was supporting us and allowing us to run the business out of the apartment because there were shoes everywhere. And then we graduated out of that apartment. He moved into uh, a different place. We moved into a different apartment. And in that other apartment, there was an extra bedroom. And so we obviously share a bedroom and we had that extra space. So we said, how can we make this space? How can we do the most with this space? And then we moved from that apartment into another apartment that had a little loft. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't needed. We, weren't, we didn't need a warehouse. Now, to answer your question about how did we know it to move into this warehouse uh, for a couple different reasons. One, as Lindsay mentioned, we're going to be starting a family this year. Uh, so we wanted to separate the business from our living space so that we could, we could have two. Uh, two, we, we've started hiring staff and it's a little less awkward uh, to have the staff come in to the warehouse than it is to come into your living room to work. Uh, and three, we're going to be purchasing a home in the next uh, couple months. And in order it, it's just going to make that transition from our apartment into a home so much easier. Like the, the business is a skip a beat because all it's being run out of this warehouse facility. So we're just going to enjoy the process of moving into our house while our business runs in full swing. And then the, I guess the last thing is the risk versus the reward. We got, we got very lucky. As I mentioned earlier, we don't need 13,000 square feet. So when we came and first looked at this place, uh, we were like, this is so cool. There's no way we're moving in like no much space. And then a couple months went by and the Amazon salsa guy and Ben and the other book people, they all connected and said, Hey, why don't all three of us move in? We'll split the costs. And it brought the cost way down. Uh, so then it was like a no brainer. It, it was, uh, the, the rent on this place 
is is a half a day's worth of profit for us right now. And that's not bragging. That's just showing the risk where the overhead is so minimal that it made, it made complete sense to move in. And then with like the day-to-day -day, um, tasks, we're really, really creating a system. So in regards to like the sourcing, the, even the putting the inventory into a you know Google sheet, the cleaning, the photography, the listing, the shipping, everything, the storage, whatever, we have through trial and error and keeping track of everything and monitoring everything, we find out really quickly the things that work and the things that don't work. And we focus on the things that are working and we get rid of the things that aren't. Um, and so just on these little things and after, you know, three and a half years of doing this um, and through trial and error, I've figured out the best systems for us and our space and our lifestyle um, with each of those small sections of our business. Because we don't want to work 14 hours and we rarely work eight hour days. Um, and so we want when we're on to be on and to be able to utilize that time the best that we can with whatever we're doing. That's kind of awesome that you have. Uh, the systems down at this point uh, of doing it. And, you know, if you're able to get your overhead so low that it makes sense to get a warehouse, uh, it, it's, it's almost like the decision was made for you to pull the trigger on that. And it seems like it's really working out. So as far as like the future is concerned, uh, you got people in the beginning. Now you have people under you that are, are doing some of the tasks for you. Where do you see this going? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, we, when we answer this question, we really think about consistency because anyone can have a really, really good day. Everyone has like a really bummer day and you try to figure out in between. We really like this idea of this consistency and we focus on understanding when we do get, for example, our first big goal uh, in the beginning was how can we average selling one pair per day? And for us, that seemed like absolutely insane. And we sold more than 30 pairs in the first month. So that's, I mentioned earlier, it's like our goal was too low. Then we said, all right, how can we sell 10 pairs per day? And then it took us, it took us a while to get to that 10 pair per day mile. But then when we, or Mark, but then when we got there, we really backed up and said, what are we doing to ensure that we keep doing 10 pairs a day? And so the long-winded answer to answer your question is right now, uh, financially, the, the profits that we're pumping out every single month, we're at about, I would say about 75% of where we wanna be consistently. Once we get to that 100% mark, where we're pumping out that profit month after month with basically us with our hands off the business, meaning people are sourcing, they're dropping it off at the warehouse, someone's coming in and cleaning the shoes that need cleaning, someone's coming in and photographing, they're handing it off to our listing team, the listing team is getting everything listed and then someone is shipping literally all parts of the business. Once that's happening with us not doing anything at that 100% mark, that's when we're going to be able to obviously back off, focus on obviously family time. Uh, by then, we're going to have maybe one or two kids uh, with our projections of, of the shoe numbers. I can't project when we're exactly going to have kids, but... Uh, <laughs> projecting 2.5 children. <laughs> yeah, once we have 1.25 children... <laughs> But the way, that, the way that our business is trending right now, uh, if everything continues to gradually grow as it is uh, over the next year or so, we'll be at that point. And then we're going to start uh, investing our money into land and real estate, you know, all around. We're not, we're not, I don't think we're going to dive directly into flipping that real estate, but we really want to be land owners in places all around the country and all around the world, which of course I think will lead into opportunities that we find to maybe flip some properties again at we're not going to stop reselling shoes that's going to be the the engine that churns maybe a lot of the other different adventures that we try out and, and as Lindsay said we didn't start this whole thing to be just literally working our face off and since the very beginning we've really focused on that goal and refining the systems that we have and so today we do sell a tremendous amount more shoes than we did in the beginning but it's kind of interesting we have way more free time. Mm. So people think that because we have a warehouse, because we're doing these high volumes, because we have these big shipments going out, we must be working more. But in fact, we're working a lot less. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And that's it's only, it, it's only because we've refined the systems that work for us. And there's lots of different ways that people can do that. Yeah. So Lindsay, what, what does a work week look like for you guys as far as hours put in? Yeah, it, it definitely varies, but typically, um, most, well, we ship 
jobs uh, six days a week. So we're always shipping. Um, and depending on what else we're doing, it varies on what time of day, but like a normal day, we'll get up and we'll, um, I get up really early. The dog gets me up. I get up between four 30 and five 30. Um, and, and I'm up for the day and then Ryan's up around seven or so. Well, let's be super clear. We also go to bed really early. I hadn't gone to that part yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just woke up in my, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so we wake up and then we'll come to the warehouse at like eight 30 or something. And then we pull all of the, um, pairs that sold the day before, and then we'll package those up. And then, um, we'll either need to put pairs in the charts and while we're doing that, we're dividing them between pairs that need cleaning and pairs that only need like stickers removed. Um, and so we'll get the pairs that need cleaning bagged up and we'll get them um, put aside. And then we have someone who comes and picks those up and they take them at home and clean them. And then we'll sometimes do the pairs that don't need a lot of cleaning. So that'll take like, we'll do an hour and we'll just take the stickers off. Um, and then if three afternoons a week, we have someone who comes and photographs. So if she like can't come or doesn't do enough because we um, list 25 pairs six days a week, if she hasn't done the amount that we need, then one of us will photograph some pairs. We always get our shipping dropped off between like two and three. And then we're pretty, we're pretty much done for the day. Yeah, yeah. It's We're really like very, yeah, it's, it's, I think people are alarmed when they hear that. I mean, we do have some long days, like usually Thursdays is a sourcing day where um, it's a little different now with um, uh, COVID and stuff, but we'll um, do a longer sourcing trip. And so that's usually, you know, 10 hour day or sometimes a 12 hour day. Um, but that's pretty much the one sourcing day besides popping into like a local thrift every now and again. Yeah. Sundays and fall um, are usually like football day. Um, so we usually take Sundays and just go paths except this season, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like very chill. And then we're, we're home. I can't think of the last time we were home after four, feed the dog, eat dinner, bed by six <laughs> 30. <laughs> no. And that's not an exaggeration. Like, it, and that's, that's just what works for us. Like Lindsay gets up super early. I usually wake up between six and seven. She's already got a couple cups of coffee in her. We, we, the day is that, and, and we like to just unwind around dinner time. And sometimes that means a movie and we fall asleep watching the movie and we're literally sleeping by seven. Sometimes that is, sometimes there's a night game on and we'll watch that and stay up a little bit later, but we fully realize that that's not going to be the case when we start having children. So we're trying to soak it up now. Uh, and, and again, if, if you're not a morning person, that doesn't mean you have to all of a sudden wake up at four like Lindsay does or wake up at six like I do and then do the thing. It just means you got to figure out what works best in your day. We also know people who are extremely successful resellers that do all of their stuff like midnight to 3 a.m. And we can't even fathom doing that because that's not like how we function, but that works best for them. They still get all their sleep and uh it's game on it's, so it's definitely different now because now that we're in the warehouse it's really freed us up to hire people so we have someone who cleans we have someone who photographs and we have a team that list so really ryan and i are just um sourcing and shipping and then obviously like keeping track of the random tasks around here um yeah. so really it's like managing the other people doing these tasks is taking the majority of our time because we're not doing them ourselves yeah all right. Well, I mean, congrats again on, uh, you know, making your schedule to what it is that you want to do. And that that's really just uh, some amazing stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm just like impressed by the whole operation, to be honest. I mean, it, it is really inspiring. So, and not only do you have this operation, but you guys have built a following as well, which is, isn't easy. And uh, can you talk about how you went about building that following over time? uh with youtube and instagram that sort of thing yeah the, the great irony is from zero followers let's just use instagram for an example from from zero to a thousand a following of a thousand was extremely difficult because we were intentionally trying to build a following uh we were trying to say like holy smokes like i i think it's important you know to build a brand we didn't in the very, very, very beginning, we tried, we saw other people selling shoes on Instagram. So we would post and say, Hey, we have these shoes They're They cost this much, you know, DM us if you want them. 
and it was not successful at all. It, it wasn't fun because Instagram's a place where you can buy stuff, but there's so many things that happen on Instagram outside of buying and selling. We decided it wasn't for us. And then, so it literally took us forever to get to a thousand yeah, like a followers. Year. Then we said, you know what? We've had a few times where people have reached out to us and said, Hey, uh, I see that you're reselling shoes. Like I I'd like to do that. Can you tell me how? And so in the DMS, we'd like be talking to them and we enjoyed that. And we were like, Oh, this is really cool. It feels genuine, right? It feels instead of just being a random stranger, liking the post or a random stranger doing a thumbs up on the, in the comments, it felt like, Holy smokes, we're kind of building, like you said, building a little community. So we said, why don't we just use our social media? Uh, you know, at that time, it was just Instagram and Facebook to just tell people what we're doing, like show them exactly how we're doing. And at the time that went against the norm of other big resellers. They were high, you know, they were hiding stuff. They were saying, don't tell anyone where you got the shoes and don't tell anyone how you sell the shoes and don't tell. And it's just not our nature. And so we said, Hey, this is exactly where we get all the shoes. This is exactly how we clean them. This is, and then holy smokes, the following just like skyrocketed. And we went from a thousand to like 5,000 really quickly. And then we blasted past 10,000. And I don't even know what we're at now. I think we're in like the thirties, 30 something thousand, which we, we don't really pay attention to quantity. We just like putting out content that says, listen, there's no excuses. Like this is exactly how we're doing it. We don't talk about things we don't do. For example, we don't use eBay. We don't use Amazon. That kind of surprises people. So if you ask us eBay or Amazon questions, we say, we have no idea. We can't help you. But if you use these other marketplaces that we use, here's exactly what we do. Here's exactly how we get these wins. Uh, here's where we are on these marketplaces. So you can see our, our closets, or our listings, or like all this stuff. And to the long-winded answer to answer your question is we didn't try to build a following. We just said, hey guys, this is, this is real. Like this is an opportunity. We've changed our lives. Uh, if this is something that you want to take the time to put in the work, this is how you do it. And it literally has not affected our business one second there. Of course, I'm not, we're not naive. There are people who will uh, copy exactly what we do. And for example, underprice us on the marketplaces. We still continue to grow. They'll buy the same shoes. They'll buy, they'll, they'll do the same photography, whatever you want to, they'll, they'll literally copy and paste our descriptions and we continue to grow. And, and good on them. Like do whatever you got to do to hit your goals. As long as you're respecting the people around you and, and game on the, the world is yours. So, uh, we built our following, not trying to build a following, but just trying to show by example, what we were doing. So has the following at this point helped uh, your operation or has it made any change at all? I mean, it, it I mean, it opens up certain yeah. opportunities like, this warehouse was Ryan was in a Nike outlet and some random guy was like, Oh my God, Rinzi and started a conversation. And he is the owner of this building. Yeah. So like there's these random connections that we wouldn't have had in relationships we, we've built um, solely through our following and through Instagram, which we're both like incredibly grateful for because we've met the most amazing people. But as far as sales, I mean, obviously that trickles down to us now, you know, be able, being able to ha have a higher volume, but yeah, we, we may financially, we intentionally do not sell to our following. So like, of course there's been people who are like, Oh my gosh, I saw you sourcing and I saw you picked up that pair. I really want that pair. And we say, okay, they're going to be cleaned and listed on the marketplaces we use within the next week. So we'll say, you know, you got to go to, yeah, but you guys could save money if I buy them from you through. And we're like, we appreciate that, but our financial business is through those marketplaces. So if you want to, per of course, send us an offer and, you know, we'll give you a deal because you're, you know, whatever, but we don't say message us here on Instagram and buy from us here because we'll save money and blah, blah, blah. Like we really use our social media and our, our output to, to be uh, content around showing what we're doing and how we're doing it. And as Lindsay said, we bump into people all the time. I mean, I don't know if you can see, I'm wearing a hat that says Rinzi. But before we were all, before everyone was wearing masks, uh, you know, people would run up and say, holy smokes, like, I see you guys online. And then we sit there in the thrift or we sit there in the outlet, we, could, we split up the inventory or, or, or we flip pairs together. Like there's, there's literally in the shoe category, there's enough for all of us, which is why we don't feel bad sharing. And there's so few people who will take action on the info that if you're, holy smokes, if you're out there like us, 
game on. Let's 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 build alongside of each other. And that's built some really cool relationships in an otherwise what could be it seemingly a lonely uh, environment as a reseller when it, especially if you're trying to like hide everything and like sneak like sneak around it's it's no bueno yeah putting that information out there to to help i mean just seems to when you give you get it seems so you guys are yeah. definitely doing the right thing uh now I, i'd like to switch a little bit to tactical uh for the resellers out there that are active uh, do you have any tips for them to make a higher dollar amount or what advice would you give fellow resellers if you can in a soundbite? Uh, every excuse that you possibly have, uh, there's a solution and don't get fancy. It's, it's super, super simple to understand that we, we, the phrase we say all the time, all the time is consistency in the basics. So it doesn't matter what you're selling. We resell shoes you can look up the value of that item on the marketplace you're using and then make a smart decision based on what it's selling for against the buy cost. And that's what you should be doing. What some people will say that doesn't matter. Other people will say that's all I do. Like that's as a new reseller. Now let's back into our world at, for shoes. Yes. When we're in the thrift and in the beginning, we would look up the value of the shoes on the marketplace. And what we mean by that, if, you, if, if people aren't familiar, is we would look up the completed sales. So I'm I'm in the warehouse right now. These are my warehouse shoes. These are shearling lined LL Bean slippers. So if I saw these in the thrift, the first thing I would do is say, are these in good condition? No rips or tears, good tread, you know, you know, no stinky smell. Wave them around underneath the nose, make sure there's no smell. And then I would say, okay, and I would take out my phone and I would look up men's 10. LL Bean shearling line slippers on the marketplace, for example, Poshmark that I plan to sell them. And then I would click through the sold listings and see how much they're selling for. Now, if these are $10 in the thrift and they're selling for 40 or 50, I'm in a good place. If they're $10 in the thrift and they're selling for $10 on the marketplace, I'm not in a good place. And so that's what we mean by the basics. We did that from the beginning. We still do that now. Of course, we have a better knowledge, but the tactic stays the same no matter how much volume you want to sell. You have to source stuff at a low enough buy cost to sell it for its market value on the marketplace you're using to make a profit. Yeah, and don't assume that a pair is going to be profitable. Um, don't just because you like it. Like in the beginning, it would be like, oh, I like these, so someone else will. Um, don't, you don't You don't need to guess on things like that because there is like hard facts of this stuff, whether it's going to sell and what, what it's going to sell for. So don't guess. Um, and then look up anything you're not sure about. Like we still find brands that we've never heard of. And we're like, Hmm, this, this seems like a well-built shoe. Let's look it up. And, uh, yeah, you know, we'll be like, Oh, shoot, this is good. Yeah. One of the mistakes that we made. So if you're listening to this or watching this is in the very, very beginning, we, we were like Under Armour, Nike, Adidas, like these are big brands, so they must be profitable. And we didn't even look at any other shoes. We were like, no, no way Skechers will make any money. We were like, those are silly, Ske you know, silly people wear Skechers. That's not even a thing. Literally for like two years, we passed <laughs> on Skechers. Now it's in our top five brands sold. And on the flip side of that, I remember there, there's a brand called Hoka. It's called Hoka Oneone, or some people call it Hoka One One. Love Hokas, by the way. They're probably my favorite shoe to run in ever. I mean, they're they're just the most comfortable shoe ever. <laughs> so this will hit home for you. The yeah. first time I came across Hokas, we were in a thrift. I literally put them on, and I ran around the thrift making. F I thought they were rodeo clown shoes <laughs> because because those, like you said, they're 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 a phenomenal brand. I had, I knew nothing about it. I was so naive. They've got giant soles because they're made for running. They're, they're such a good brand. They're a well-made shoe, but I, I had no knowledge. I literally thought that they were clown, like bull, like the clowns that run around in bull rings. And I'm running around and she was like, you look silly. Like we're not getting those. And I was like, oh, let's look these up. No, and no, no, not $100. even. dollars <laughs> They're expensive. Money. We bought them and listed them. We didn't even look them up. We just listed them and literally like sold in seconds. We put them up for like 25 bucks and they sold instantly. And we're like, what is this? Why, why did these sell so quick? Didn't do it. Yeah. We didn't and then do. we were like, oh, cause these are $160 running shoes that everyone wants. Yeah. And now obviously. So again, the, the long story long is uh, do the research because it'll tell you and then understand that 
sometimes you want a shoe to be profitable and it's just not. I mean, that, that's the fact. And, and being able to say no to the things you should say no to and then doing the research and, and broadening your mind and saying yes to those things is, has really allowed us to scale. In the beginning, we sold only a couple of brands. Now we consistently sell you know, 80 plus brands every single month. And we're not even close to being scratching the surface mm -hmm. of the potential of, of, of what the shoe world has for us. When you get into that situation where you say made a couple of bad decisions or you do have that uh, death pile or dead inventory, <laughs> what, what are you doing with that stuff? Well, we don't have dead inventory. And so <laughs> let me back up to the beginning. So if, we understand why for, for every reason I just said is why people get dead inventory, right? If you don't do the research, if you assume, then you of course are going to make mistakes in buying stuff. Our mistakes, they're hundred percent mine are, I didn't look over the shoe thorough enough and I get home and I find there is a rip in the shoe. And then we're obviously not going to sell a shoe that's ripped. And so we got to kind of eat the cost on that. I mean, we still pull the laces out. Um, if it's got a removable sole that's still in good condition, we'll try to use that. Uh, in another shoe maybe, but those have been our mistakes. We, we don't make mistakes. Our shoes sell. Like if, wow. if they're in good condition, it's because we've done, if, if we are spending our hard earned money on a shoe to multiply our money, it's going to make us money. And that, let me, let me compound that conversation. There's multiple game plans. We don't mean that we buy a shoe because it's selling well on Poshmark and a hundred percent of the time sells on Poshmark we mean we have multiple game plans for every single pair and our worst, worst case scenario is us profiting money. Sometimes people set the bar at worst, worst case scenario, I'll just get my money back and that'll be okay. And that's not okay for us. We wanna make money on every single pair that we spend money on. And so there's, tier, there's a tiered system. Of course, we price at the high end of comps of the completed sales to leave a little room to negotiate. And then it trickles down. Sometimes if it doesn't sell within a week or two, we, we run a sale on it. If it doesn't sell, uh, maybe we move it, we list it on a local marketplace at that point for a lot lower that has no uh, fees like Facebook marketplace or, or offer up or let go or something like that. So we have a tiered system. Our worst case scenario is doubling our money. And we've done that since the very beginning. I told you our first business model was buy under $10 and sell for 25. So our worst, worst case scenario was we were turning a $10 bill into a $25 bill. So just all about the upfront, making sure that you do the, the work upfront to, to know that you're not going to be purchasing something that you're going to be stuck with seems like the message there. So yeah. do you guys have uh, any final thoughts? I mean, this has been a great interview. Uh, we've learned a ton so far. So any, any final thoughts for the, for the audience and, uh, and the fellow flippers out there? I would say one thing is, um, just because a lot of people that probably watch these interviews and just like us in the beginning and still now we have to catch ourselves. Um, don't compare yourself to other resellers. Like don't look at us and think that you should be doing what we're doing, how we're doing it. Um, we got stuck doing that a lot in the beginning where we were watching these other people and we are like, Oh man, like we want to do what they're doing this and that, but like their style doesn't work with their eBay sellers, their Amazon sellers, or they, our night people. There's so many other variables that you need to just compare yourself to yourself yesterday or yourself last week or yourself last month or year. Um, and so keep track of all of your numbers for everything and then make sure you're just comparing yourself and doing better to yourself and doing better than you did before as, a, and you know, learn from other people, but don't get caught up on, you know, wanting to focus so much on other people and what they're doing. Yeah. And I think the thing that I would add to that is we've been very conscious since the very beginning of building a reselling business, following all the rules mm -hmm. so that we were always in control of our business. And, and I'll use an example. Uh, I'll use two examples. One example, when you're sourcing, sometimes people will try to like build these relationships where they're getting like the backdoor deal at the thrift or the backdoor deal at the outlet or i mean it's literally called backdooring uh where like you get the you get the inventory for a lower cost than everyone else or you get the special deal and although that might on the short term give you an advantage and maybe make some more money you are now subject to that deal right like if it's a deal with a manager or a certain thrift you're building your business around that and if that deal goes away 
your business goes away and you, you have to sacrifice it. So we've been very conscious, like our entire model is walking into outlets or thrift stores and buying the shoes for the price that they're asking, which everyone else can do. They can walk in and buy, and buy this so they can do the same exact thing. So we're never uh, subject to that. Like we're always in control. It's just do we either do it or we don't do it. And then the other thing, when it comes to reselling, understandably, people always try to figure out efficiencies. Uh, one example I can think of on Poshmark is one of the things that annoys people is you have to share your listings. You have to manually share your listing. And it's recommended that you do that every single day. Now, that can be very tiresome. It can be annoying because it, there's no talent involved. It's just like share, 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 share. Now, imagine you have hundreds and hundreds of listings people start to say, this is dumb. This is dumb. On Poshmark, you're not allowed to use any automated services to run your business, meaning bots or whatever. Now there are automated services out there that will go through and literally like, like share all your listings for you. And it costs like 10 bucks a month. So you're thinking, Hey, I can do this thing. I know it's not allowed on Poshmark, but like, hopefully they don't catch me. And you're right. They may never, never, ever catch you. But Instead, we decided to pay a little more. We pay $100 per month and we hired a virtual assistant. who It's another human that goes in and shares our listings for us. So it does cost 10 times more, but we're following all the rules. Like you're allowed to hire a staff, you're allowed to hire virtual assistants. And so those are two examples of how we specifically have managed our business following all the rules. So don't compare yourself to other people and as best as you possibly can. And for us, it's 100% of the time, follow the rules and there's all kinds of rules so that you are always in control of your business. And ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Because a lot of people, like we asked a lot of questions <clears throat> in the beginning, a Tons. lot of people did not respond to us, um, but some people did. And we definitely will. We responded hundreds of questions through Instagram and YouTube um, and Facebook every day. So you'll find accounts and people um, that will answer your questions. So keep asking them. Yeah. Wow, amazing guys. I really want to acknowledge you guys, both Ryan and Lindsay your amazing brand and the, the following, everything that you've done for the reseller community. Uh, you guys are two amazing people and uh, certainly pillars in the community. So thank you guys for, for coming on and uh, sharing your story here today. Uh, how can we find you guys? Uh, where, where do you guys want to uh, point the audience to? Yeah, I think the, the easiest thing is through Instagram. We're under uh, Rinzi now. Uh, unfortunately, when we signed up for Instagram, Rinzi was taken by a New Zealand sailing team, I think. So we, uh, we go by Rinzi now uh, on Instagram. You can reach out to us there. We have a YouTube channel. You can connect with us uh, on Facebook. Um, we have a podcast. You can shoot us a voice message, message through there. Whatever is easier for you. The more, the more people we connect with, the better. There's no such thing as a silly question, as Lindsay said. Uh, if you just want to say hi. That's cool too. Uh, technology allows us to talk to thousands of people every week and hundreds of people every single day. Uh, and again, it means a lot. You, you said some really, really nice, kind words. Um, I, again, we don't look at ourselves as pillars in the community. We don't look at ourselves as anything other than a husband and wife that enjoy what we're doing. And I love connecting with other people that are you know, excited about what, what, what they're doing. Uh, there's way bigger resellers. Even we live in Maine. There's people who are 10 times the size of us in terms of quantity and financials right in here in our home state. Uh, but we're going to continue to grow and share our adventure and connect with amazing people like you and, and connect with uh, anyone else who wants to just own each and every single one of their days, whether it's reselling shoes or, or reselling anything or whatever, like just, just connect with us and say hi. And if you have questions, we're, we're always able to answer. All right, guys, thanks so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and definitely get to bed by 7 p.m. <laughs> oh, we'll be we'll be deeply oh, by seven. What time my is friend. it right oh. now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys.